So I'm very happy to welcome Phyllis Zagano, the author, writer, expert on women deacons and all around Catholic media superstar from Long Island. Welcome to WPI Perspectives, Phyllis. Thank you so much, Mike. Um, yeah, so uh, Phyllis, you've done a lot of, this is, I believe the third time that I've interviewed you for a thir third podcast. Um, the previous two times we spoke, it once was about your book on uh, women as icons of Christ. And last year, Jeannie Gaffigan and I spoke to you on Field Hospital um, about the role of women in the church. This time, we're going to discuss mainly synodality, but also touching on the, the your areas of expertise. Um, and so first, I just want to ask how you're doing and, and, and if you're looking forward to this upcoming synod. Well, I'm doing great. You know, actually, I am looking forward to it. Uh, I'm not being in Rome. Uh, in the past week, I've had four interview requests, and wow. uh, a lot of people are talking, and I think that's the best thing that could happen about the Synod um, and for synodality. You know, uh, a lot of people don't know what's going on, so the more talk, the better. <laughs> yeah, and actually, that leads into, into the first topic that I wanted to discuss. So recently, and we'll post this in the show notes, um, you wrote a column for Religion News Service, uh, and the title was The Secret Synod. Um, and so I just thought a few of the points that you made jumped out at me. Um, I thought it was a very good article that sort of comprehensively presented the synod from the U.S. perspective um, and along the way, maybe we'll talk about how the Synod is, is being approached and received in other parts of the world. But you, early in your, in your column, you put in this line, what will they talk about? That is the big question. Catholics who have heard about the Synod are wondering what is happening. It is not supposed to be that way. So why do you think so many people don't understand the purpose of the synod or they're confused about the concept of synodality. Obviously these are new things, but it seems that in, especially in the U S you hear people just quipping what's a synod or thinking that it's about changing church teachings. Like, why do you think that this message has not been communicated? Well, you know, Mike, we're not in the in the fourth or fifth century. We're not in the tenth or eleventh century. We are <clears throat> far away from the the actual practice of local synods. And uh, I think that what what the problem is is that uh, the church is a little neuralgic in understanding its own history. Uh, this is nothing new. Uh, and uh, the the notion of people discussing questions, even questions of doctrine. Um, is is not new either. I mean, I, I I always think of, I think it was the 10th, 11th century, the butchers and bakers in Bézier were having fistfights over the real, the question of real presence, you know. Um, now, I hope that doesn't happen in Rome. Uh, and I, I, as far as I know, doctrinal questions are not there for discussion as in overturning them. Um, the uh, Holy Father always comments and, and quotes St. Uh, Vincent of Lorraine, who talks about the development of doctrine. But I, for the most part, Cardinal Grech twice has said that doctrines are not up for discussion. And I think, I, go ahead. Well, I think specifically the, these two are, the two that he's, he's referring to are the ordination of women as priests and the question of gay marriage. I mean, it's just, it's just not, a, not up for discussion at this point. Yeah, I think it's, I think this is, the particular kind of thing in the U, uh, particular issue in the U.S., where the idea of the church seems to be that it's a top-down organization, and the alternate alternative approach would be seeing the church as a democracy, or uh, you know we don't have a parliament here, but it, the description of a parliamentary group that's going to vote right. on topics and get things done and change policies. And that's not really what uh, what the synod's purpose is, right? Well, not at all. You know, the, you have to remember it's a synod on synodality, and the terms used are communion, uh, mission, and participation. So we've got to be in communion with each other. 
uh, we have to understand the mission. The mission is the, the pro proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ. And then the question of participation, who, who gets to play, who does what? And these are the things that can be discussed. But I think in this Senate, um, the first week is the most important because that's when people are uh, being uh, being educated to exactly what synodality is, even though the even though the people who are attending, I think it's something like 400 and something, 454, 464, something like that. Um, they uh, supposedly had already participated in synodal practice in their parishes, dioceses, and on the national levels. So perhaps even on the continental levels, but. And, uh, and and one of the important things also about that first week is, is well, in preceding the first week is that they're going to be taking part in a prayer retreat. And each day of the synodal assembly will be filled with periods of prayer and contemplation and different kinds of, of, of spiritual exercises. And, and I think that what they want to emphasize is that we need to have this openness to God, the openness to listening to the Holy Spirit and people who are a lot of people tend to seem like they're being cynical about the whole idea of approaching openly and honestly uh, what the church needs moving forward. I think you're right. I, I, and I, I know for a fact at least two bishops uh, from Europe who uh, have, have announced, I don't know if they've told the Holy Father, but they've said, no, they're too busy to go to this retreat business. They'll just show up for the synod. I think that misses, that misses the whole point uh, because it is to uh, engage in prayerful conversation with, with the rest of the church. Um, it's not an assembly. It's not a parliament. It's not a debating. This is a, a, a pro process of listening. And I think the other problem uh, we, we have when you insert the question of clericalism into the whole event is that uh, the real clericalist cleric figures, okay, I'll listen to you and, yeah. and goodbye. <laughs> so. so, and when we talk about, when you talk about engagement, um, another thing that jumped out at me in your column was about the continental phase of, of the synod. Yes. And basically you wrote about how the delegations, mm -hmm. you know, the various countries of the continental group would come and meet together in a place and, work together to, to discuss and, and to draft their continental reports. But you noted the exception was the North America, US and Canada assembly, which met by Zoom, prompting critics to point out that avoiding in-person meetings, which take longer and are more difficult to organize, defeats the entire synodal process. And this kind of points to the next general topic I'd like to discuss, which is uh, the North American, but specifically the U.S. church leadership's disposition and treatment of this synod. A lot of people have complained that it's almost a side note for the U.S. for many of the, of the U.S. bishops, including um, their leadership and some of the some of the bishops who are actually going from the U.S. to the synodal assembly. Um, are you picking up on this sense? Well, yeah, <laughs> I think I think Mike. I'm throwing you softballs here. <laughs> well, in the in the June assembly, you know, it wasn't until the media pointed out that uh, Bishop Flores of Brownsville, who was the synod leader for the USCCB, the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops, it wasn't until the media pointed out that he wasn't on the agenda for the June meeting that he was added. Um, and also uh, the opening speech by the papal nuncio, uh, Archbishop, actually Cardinal uh, Christophe Pierre, uh, gave, gave them a pretty good talking to about what synodality is and said, you know, it's here to stay. And, and I think that there is a great deal of recalcitrance throughout the United States, which um, seems to default in too many dioceses and archdioceses to uh, pray, pay and obey. And they're just not interested in having, um, they have to have a pastoral, a diocesan pastoral council. They don't have to listen to them. They have to have a diocesan financial council or, or, or committee. Um, the bishop is, uh, is the one who would require his, di his parishes in, in his diocese to have pastoral councils. 
And too many parishes in the United States have parish councils or pastoral councils and don't pay any attention to them. I always think, Mike, of the, the pastor that we had in my parish years ago, and he said, well, he came and knew. He said, oh, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll meet with them maybe four times a year. You know, they only want to talk about holes in the plot. So. And I've, I've found uh, sort of an in-joke, and, and hopefully it's not 100% the case, but a lot of I've heard pastors joke about how they, uh, they use the um, – they blame. They use the council so they have someone to blame when they have to make an unpopular decision. That's true. So, That's true. Um, but but in general, they ignore them. And and yeah. I, I until there is proper formation of of uh, priests and I would say deacons, um, the scourge of clericalism will continue in in the church. Uh, I mean, it's it's as simple as that. Um, the uh, the notion of the ontological change has literally gone to their heads and the pastor is king in his parish and uh, you can do whatever you want as long as it's what I want. <laughs> I mean, it's I guess it's a difficult system because the Catholic the Catholic ecclesiology and power structure we have. There's, you know, overhauling that is not really an option or if it was, it's not up to. Uh, you know, it's not up to the laity, um, but it seems that the system we have can only work if the leaders decide to buy yes. into yes. these principles of synodality yeah. and collaboration and listening. And it's frightening to me that so many U.S. bishops either, uh, you know, put conditions on the type of speech that can be made or they make themselves inaccessible or... I think this seems to be the most common response in the U.S. and I think by USCCB leadership is to give just enough lip service That's to the right. Pope, um, just give enough lip service to synodality, apply those terms to their own personal projects like, oh, this is in line with what Pope Francis said about whatever, um, but not really demonstrating that they've bought into the message that they bought into being a synodal church or that they've made any commitment to it. It's, it's sort of like, well, why do we need to talk about the synod at the bishop's meeting? We all, we already filled out those questionnaires and sent them That's into right. the Vatican. Now we've got our own project that we've got to, that we've got to deal with. Well, you know, I'm, I'm writing a kind of long academic article studying the way the U S has responded to the question of uh, the synod and synodality. And, uh, the, the the travesty of the uh, the Zoom meetings for the North American uh, the North American uh, or at least the United States participation in the in the response to the doc, the document for the continental stage uh, they had 931 people in something like 12 Zoom meetings uh, mostly in English some in uh, three in Spanish two in French. Uh, it, it just isn't what it was supposed to be. And I, one commenter, I think somebody from Rome said to me, you know, for crying out loud, in Oceania, they got there by canoe. You know? <laughs> and and how, I don't know if that's true, but that, that was a comment. And there were meetings. Uh, Canada had, uh, I think, three, four regional meetings. Uh, Ceylon and South America had several regional meetings. The uh, European Assembly uh, and the others were held in, in one place in uh, Prague and in, in Lebanon, in, in, in Prague and in, in, in Czechoslovakia, in, in the Czech Republic and in, in um, Beirut and Lebanon. Uh, you know, and uh, I, I think that uh, of the seven, the most disappointing was the North American um, meeting. Uh, which took place basically in January. There was one one meeting December 14th, and then the rest of them were during the month of January. Because that's just not it. That, that's not what you do. You don't get together for two and a half hours on a Zoom. You don't send somebody five pages of instructions and say, go think about this, and, and then enter into some kind of a meeting. Now, during COVID, we, we did have Zoom synod meetings. I participated in whatever I could find, um, the, uh, the Carmelites at, at, uh, in Maryland had it, uh, another group that I know of women religious had it, but, uh, it's, it's not the same, uh, you know, uh, to, well, and I think talking to that's, 
that's I mean, I think that's that's part of the concept of what Pope Francis is trying to do with the Synod. Um, I think in a lot of parts of the world, especially in the US, the church is seen as just another consumer item or or another um, association to belong to. You you go to the meetings that you want to, you go to the, the, the masses that you want to, you listen to a talk, maybe you have your little group of friends within the church. Now, this isn't everybody's experience, but this this seems to be the the typical experience. And so um, things become optional. They don't or it doesn't there's less of a sense of belonging. Um, and I mean, the, just the language of journeying together, um, you know, Peter, you know, with and under Peter, we're all together. We're all in this together. Everything is connected. If we're going to quote from Laudato Si, um, being church, which I know that a lot of uh, a lot of conservative Catholics sort of scoff at leaving out the the, but what we're really doing is we are living out our baptism. We should be living out our baptism every day, and we should also be acknowledging our 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 unity with one another through through that baptism. We're we're a family. We're um we're we are a people, uh, not just members of a club. And well, I think yes. that's what's led to a lot of that alienation. You know, people get kicked out. People people feel right. alienated because they aren't exactly right. And I think that radical inclusivity is is the notion that that's not the right way of doing things. Yes, I I don't want to come down that hard on Zoom though. You know, I, yeah. I think it can be both and, but the notion of of synodality is in person meetings. And you know, I wrote a, an article in Commonweal, uh, I think in in June of of this year of twenty twenty three, about uh, the way synodality worked in a different context. Uh, I what what I said was, you know, as, as we moved through. Uh, the Renaissance and, and moved into the modern era, the church found a need uh, for religious work. Uh, of course, I'm writing about the diaconate, that the diaconal yeah. works of the church had died. But really what happened would be a, a small group of people would sit around and say, how can we spread the gospel in communion with the church in this neighborhood where we are? And so in the 17th century, you have the Sisters of St. Joseph uh, in Le Puy, founded with, you know, six or eight women. Um, and you have the same replicated uh, in Europe and really around the world where men and women, lay people, sat around and said, how can we better spread the gospel? And and I think that's what uh, I see as the, the notion of synodality. It's we're sitting around locally and saying, well, what are the problems here where we are in Long Island? Here are the, What are the problems here where we are in Maryland? Uh, here, what are the problems that... Um, that we can address. Uh, so, uh, of course, I, I find a deacon under every rock. So I see it as a, <laughs> as, a, as a diaconal service to the church because the deacon is the one who carries the gospel into the celebration. The deacon is the one who, who drags the ambo to the street, in the words of uh, Bill Dightwig, you know, and uh, that is what we we need to do. That, that has to be um, the, the touchstone for everything. Uh, that is the name of the reorganization of the Curia. Preach the gospel. Yeah. Well, yeah. and you know, I mean, now that now that you're talking about how you know there are groups of people that come together and they want to spread the gospel, they want to um, start initiatives. There are you know wonderful leaders among today's oh. laity in the church, and both with the deacons and with expanding lay ministries. And I don't think that I don't think Pope Francis's vision. Or, or I think only the seeds have been planted of how that may flourish. Um, that gives people in the church, you know, the 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 wives, the husbands, the single people, the the elderly, the the young adults. These these official links to the ecclesiology of the church. Um, I think that helps keep the keeps the ship right. I mean, I I'm just thinking that there's so many of these, and I mean, granted. I run one, but I, I try to stay as close to the as close to the bishops and to the Pope as possible. But these um, apostolates, these freelance apostolates start up. And if they were more and I'm I guess I'm talking more of a 
in an official sense, if they were diaconal ministries or if they were a part of the ministry of catechist or um, lector, that would that would help maintain that union so that and it would help prevent these some of these groups and well-intentioned individuals, but it would, it would it would help keep them from going adrift or rebelling against the Pope or rebelling against the Bishop or, or it, it would help keep us unified together as, as part of the church. I don't know if that resonates with you at all, but it was well, just something that came to mind. Yeah. Well, the, the four letters that you're talking about are EWTN and, and this is, uh, this is a situation in our church and it's not, it's not just in the United States, but there are individuals who, for whatever reason, think they own the church and they own uh, doctrine. And uh, if you're not with them, you're out of it. Uh, it's my football. You can't play. And uh, and the, the, the constant criticism uh, of, and, and I, it's almost you know, Hegelian dialectic that they set up, no matter what you say, they will find something different. And uh, there, there's nothing original um, in their discussion. All of their discussion is reactive and it is uh, generally negative reactive. And oftentimes it has uh, bad information. Uh, the the one, one program I saw not too long ago complained, well, they added another one of those left-wing nuns from the International Union of Superiors General. I was like, they didn't add anybody. The, the, the UISG had five representatives. One of them was the president. The president's term as president of her order ended. So they needed a new president and she replaced the other person. So they still have five. And it's, it's nitpicking um, in, in, in a... Uh, uh, in, a, in a, a very, very um, angry, um, angry way, and also presenting bad information. Uh, on my topic, the, uh, uh, the, the one thing they like to do is to connect the priesthood and the diaconate. They're two different orders, uh, absolutely two different orders. And if you don't agree with that, well, then you have to pick a fight with Benedict the Sixteenth because he explained that pretty clearly. And so uh, that, that is an unfortunate um, trap uh, that anyone can fall into when they think that synodality means um, an argument. Yeah, and unfortunately, it seems that some of, even some of the people who are going into the synod seem to already have that mentality that they're going in with with an agenda or or with a buck stops here attitude rather than one of um, openness. So I, I want to change a little bit. Uh, it's still the same topic, but I, I found the quote of yours very compelling. Um, you wrote, the, recalcin the recalcitrant bishops seem only to want Francis's papacy to end and do not care whether that's by retirement or death. They disagree with the concept that every Catholic has the right to speak, to question, to discern the ways in which the church can move forward. So I want to say, first of all, I'm glad I'm not the only one who has picked up on this. Um, it, it seems almost as if the strategy is, like I said, to mostly ignore Pope Francis, pay him just as much lip service as they need so he'll stay out of their hair. Um, and not only is this is this disrespectful, not only is this uh basically setting the church back and and preventing the church in the US from growing but i also hold their silence responsible for this whole out of control anti francis reactionary movement that that seems to have taken over catholic media it's taken over entire parishes and seminaries some dioceses you can't find a priest who doesn't have something awful to say about pope francis or uh, at least nothing positive to say. Um, I don't know. I, I, this is a, this is a movement that, that continues to worry me. And I know you watched the interview I did, I did last week with father Yvonne, and we talked about the possibility of an inside and outside synod. Um, you wrote, you also wrote that except for masses and a few speeches, the proceedings will not be televised. Further, journalists will not be permitted in the Paul VI Hall, where the Synod participants, including more than 50 women, will convene. 
Um, I worry about a vacuum in communication developing and having that vacuum filled with false narratives that will, who knows what will happen there. The, the next, you know, maybe they'll find Pachamama or something in, you know, in the, you know, outside the St. Peter's or something. It's, um, I just worry that a lack of communication from the Vatican and from the Senate itself uh, could bode poorly for um, the way that this, the effect of this Senate, at least in the short term. Okay, well, you've, you've brought up several topics here. And uh, uh, if we back up a little bit, when you have clerics broadcasting, they are doing so with the permission of their bishop, period. Mm-hmm. That, is, that is canon law. We have some clerics who actually have no faculties who are just living out there um, and they are broadcasting uh, on the internet or they're, they're uh, publishing things on the internet uh, and the bishops are doing nothing to stop this. So if you're talking about uh, Father X in a particular diocese, what he is saying is coming from his bishop, period. Uh, yeah. The bishop has, has permission. And uh, what came to mind when you started this was, uh, as you know, I used to work for Cardinal O'Connor, and I remember his talking about abortion. And he said, the pity of abortion is that the people who suffer abortion, if they really knew what they were doing, could never do it. And, and they are invincibly ignorant. But the people responsible for their invincible ignorance are their bishops, because they're not teaching. So I, I, I think that, that, that has to, those two points have to be held in mind that um, everything that's coming out of the so-called official church is coming from an individual bishop. Um, now, when, when we talk about uh, comms and the, uh, the synod itself, uh, there, there, was no, um, there was no broadcasting at the Synod of Paris or at the Council of Chalcedon, you know, people... Yeah it out and found out what was going on. I think when you're having a private discussion and you want to have a clear discussion and a prayerful discussion, it has to be done in not so much, uh, I know the term pontifical secret has been bandied about, but uh, not so much as a pontifical secret, but just as a, a simple respectful conversation. I would not want to be at a table at the synod, and it's going to be held at round tables uh, in the Paul the Sixth Hall. It will not be in the stadium uh, synod hall. Synod hall. Um, I wouldn't want anybody running out uh, to the curb and saying, "Well, she said this." You know. That's true. Yeah. I mean, and, and I mean, there there are definitely pros and cons of all of it, and I know that Pope Francis greatly values the um, the, the a purer synodal experience. Um, I guess I guess the key maybe is to make sure that the 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 Vatican communications uh, apparatus is is much more attentive to what's going on outside the Synod Hall than they were during, say, the Synod on the Amazon. Which... Well, I, I think it'd be actually <laughs> useful if they just ignored it all and and didn't give them any air. Um, I have been uh, in a commission, as you know, that was under pontifical secret. Uh, I was also asked while I was on the commission for a period of two years not to speak on my topic because it would be assumed that I was out there telling everybody what was going on inside. Mm -hmm. And and I think that allowed for a certain amount of freedom uh, in, in the discussion because we didn't have to worry about uh, media uh, coming, you know, all over us. And, and uh, I, since then, I've been fascinated to, to read about my commission because there are things I'm learning that I didn't know. And yeah. so that's the other problem that, that media makes it up <laughs> and they make up what they want to make up about what happened. But, uh, you know, if the pontifical secret is there, the pontifical secret is there and let them do what they want. Um, in terms of comms, I, I think that uh, there will be briefings. Uh, I don't. I don't know whether every day or every or after every week, uh, the uh, prayer, uh, the masses, and and some of the interventions. I understand that no one's really clear whether there will be interventions or not, but certainly the the opening events uh, will be 
will be broadcast. And I think that would be a good thing because it might help, as we said at the top, nobody knows what's going on. So a lot of people uh, have no idea that their representatives uh, are there. And even the term representative is bad because it gives the uh, the impression that this is a parliament, which it's not. Yeah. Um, it's it's a, a meeting of, of Catholics and other Christians to talk about communion, mission, participation. That's it, Busta go see. And, and uh, you know, uh, uh, any anything else uh, uh, that comes out, and I'm sure we will see it uh, and hear it in, in various blogs and, and uh, television and radio, um, is probably not true. Uh, yeah. It's probably not true. And that's, but it's, it's one of those things where I think we're, we're approaching this as if it's a major papal event like World Youth Day, or I don't know what the equivalent would be, uh, you know, Holy Week at the Vatican or something where there are all these, where it's this big event, it's all televised. There's a play by play. Oh, here's, you know, here's the, uh, here's whose feet Pope Francis washed on Holy Thursday. And you know, here, here's who did the stations on Good Friday. And this is, you know, th th there are these, these things that get rolled out. And I think because of the media hype, maybe, or, or maybe just by the nature of it being a global synod. So a lot of people uh, who are involved in the church had some role in the participation. I think there's an anticipation that there might be a lot more news than, um, than there really will be coming from outside of the, the meeting hall. And, and therefore, I think that that might cause false narratives to to spread around, and and maybe I've contributed to that. I don't know, but I'm, you know, I'm trying to help people understand the synod and not to be, um, not to worry about the synod, um, as you know, not to think it's going to cause a, a, you know, a total overhaul of Catholic doctrine or something like that. Um, well, but, you know, that, that's true, but I think you know, in in a in a sense, we've done it to ourselves. Years ago, I wrote that the problem with with uh, televising everything the Pope does is that the Pope becomes the same height as Ed Sullivan. And I yeah. think that, that it, there's a, uh, and I can remember years ago having a tour of ABC and I, I, I asked, uh, would, uh, would they want to have the Pope uh, in their, in their studio? They said, Oh no, we know what he's going to say. So, yeah. so there's a, a, a dismissive attitude toward the message of the gospel. And I really think that's what it's about. Um, there's not so much a dismissive attitude towards something that might be news. So when the German bishops are, are talking about how to deal with same-sex relationships, that becomes news. But if the uh, any other Episcopal conference is talking about um, tragedies in terms of life issues or climate issues, it's not news. Uh, yeah. And and I think that we need to remember that this synod will open on the fourth of. October, the Feast of St. Francis of Assisi. He is adding uh, Laudato Deum, Laudato Deum, Deum, uh, praise the I'm Lord. I'm looking forward to that, yeah. The second shoe of Laudato Si, and I understand it's about climate change. Now, this is, that affects everybody. That affects my topic. I, I mean, my topic is women in the church, and, you know, that's half the, and when the climate is, is uh, you know, imploding, um, it's it's the women who have to feed their and shelter their families, uh, the women who have to educate their children, the women who have to bear their children. Uh, you know, having baby, having a baby is not really a, a good idea or very easy if you're in the middle of a flood uh, or a famine. Or, a or you have to migrate to another part of the continent because yeah, you or, can't grow anything. Well, you can't grow anything and, and some idiot has started a war, you know. Yeah. But but I, I think that... that uh, um, the the Amazon Synod, which you referenced earlier, was almost hijacked by media, and the two topics were married priests and women deacons. I wasn't so upset about that hijacking, but but the fact of the matter is there are other things to think about because the Amazon is in fact the lungs of the world, and um, if we uh, if we lose the climate, we've lost everything, and uh, it's the voices. Uh, uh, at the Synod in Rome, in the Aula, uh, you know, and the voices outside, if they would focus on the the issues. And, and I think that's part of the reason he's he's uh, he's dropping that document on that day. Yeah. Um, 
as the people go into the synod, they will have had the retreat. They will start the discussion uh, and they will start the discussion, as we said, by learning uh, how to use this cookbook as, uh, as uh, Cardinal Holrich called it, uh, or actually he described it as more like the, um, uh, the exercises of St. Ignatius of Loyola. You don't really know how they work until you do it. Um, and it's, yeah. a, it's a, the Instrumental Laboris is a wonderful document and it's a document that uh, certainly all of us should be reading and praying and thinking about, maybe talking about uh, uh, throughout the uh, uh, the time of the synod. If I if I had more time, and if you had more time, uh, we would have nightly meetings with people uh, on the day's topic. You know, yeah. That actually, would be- that might be a good idea if if anybody wants to contribute that to where Peter is, like a. Uh, either to have a discussion in our in our smart Catholics group or to um, uh, write like a little bit of a reflection on on each topic that would be that would be great. I'm putting out a general call. Um, I would okay. do that. I really would because, oh, really? because we need to we need to focus on the questions. The questions have come to us from parishes to dioceses um, to uh, national conferences from continents. And there's an extraordinary resonance around the world uh, about the question of women. It's not a synod, it's not a synod on women, but maybe it should be. Yeah. Uh, so that, I mean, that, that actually brings us into topic two, which is women on the church. And I have a transitional question uh, because it's about the synod and women specifically. Um, so there are some important issues related to women in the church. Um, having to do with this synod. The first is is the makeup of the participants in the synod. Right. Um, there will be women now, I think you said it's about 50, but they will be full participants, um, lay and religious. They will take equal part in the meeting. They will in, be involved in the voting. And, you know, if there is voting, they'll take part in the interventions, if, you know, in to what extent those will take place. And I'm sure you have plenty of thoughts on that. So I'm wondering about your overall reaction. I know you've written about it. I know you've thought about it. I know you've celebrated it. I know at one point when Sister Natalie was was named undersecretary to the Synod, and that's a voting, automatic voting slot. There was a lot of excitement over that. But since then, you know, this is the first Synod that we've had since then. And, um, and many more women are taking part. It's not equal participation, but at least it's substantive participation and each woman that takes part as an individual will be an equal member of the Senate. Right. Well, we'll see. I, I think some, I think it's the number is 54 and I think some of them are experts or facilitators. So I don't know how okay. many voters there are, but yes, it's, they're both secular women uh, and religious women, all women. I would, I would caution you to remember are lay people. So, yes. oh, yeah. <laughs> so, so I think that um, uh, that that's a good thing to have those voices. And I'm, I'm reminded of my time, uh, one of my times in Rome when uh, I was there for a couple of weeks, I guess, and uh, e- living in the uh, Doma Santa Marta. And there was another English, there was an English speaking cardinal there. And for some reason, the house was pretty empty. And I ended up having 15 meals with this cardinal. Um, oh, wow. To the point where he would say, well, I'm going to be out for lunch. You know? <laughs> Um, but, uh, but he said at one point, you know, Phyllis, 20 years ago, this would never happen. We would never have had these many informal meals. Yeah. He said, no, 10 years ago, this wouldn't have happened. I well, said, and not to mention the Pope wouldn't have been there either. So well, that's... no, but even so that, <laughs> yeah. that he, you know, that, that the attitude is, I think more what he was talking about mm-hmm. the, uh, that it, it was perfectly comfortable having a discussion uh, with a woman uh, in public, uh, in a public dining room uh, at, at, in Rome. And, yeah. and now this is not to say women were never involved in the Vatican. Um, uh, a good friend but of mine. But just to have you, I guess, as a regular guest and him being a cardinal there doing right. his cardinal business and just, right. okay, this is where you sit. This is where you sit. Enjoy. You know, right. it's not. Um, yeah. Can, of, you know, can I get you a It's sort of a super exceptional thing. Well, yeah, that's right. And but I mean, that has had happened that uh, but not at that, not with that frequency and not with that many people. Uh, a good friend of mine now deceased, Marjorie Keenan, 
a religious of the Sacred Heart of Mary, was a, an officer of the uh, Pontifical Council for Justice and Peace. And she at one time was the highest ranking woman in the Curia. Oh, and wow. so she she had regular, she was multilingual. She had regular meetings. She did a lot of writing for them. But it was she was unusual. Uh, and, and the fact that the Holy Father is now adding more and more people, more and more women to management, managerial uh, positions, it just makes sense that he would add, uh, I think it's something, what would be the percentage? Uh, oh, maybe well, a little over 10, 12, 13. Little, 12, 12, yeah, 12, 15% of women uh, to uh, to this kind of a meeting, um, particularly when when the whole world has said, excuse me, you know, you need to pay attention to the problem of women. <laughs> Why don't we close the final topic? Tell me all about your book. Um, you have a new book from Paulus Press called Just Church, Catholic Social Teaching, Synodality, and Women. And unfortunately, I have not had a chance to read my copy of it. Um, there's the cover, um, but you have the floor. Tell us, tell us what you have, the wisdom that you have to share with us about this book. Well, I, you know, in 25 words or less, the 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 topics is basically three major essays: one on Catholic social teaching, Catholic synod, one on synodality, and one on on women. And what I do is I follow the way Catholic social teaching has uh, lived and grown since Rerum Novarum uh, with Leo the XIII, and specifically pick out how women have been affected and, and are treated in, in Catholic social teaching. I then move to the question of synodality and the way women have been discussed in various synods and the progression really of the respect for women and the respect for women um, as uh, intellectual beings uh, as well as the very important uh, point of women as uh, mothers, uh, mothers and teachers. So um, uh, mothers, wives and teachers, nurturers. Uh, so, so there's that. And then the question of women in the church. And, and that uh, speaks to the two points that uh, we've been talking about, women in, women in ministry, uh, certainly the advances in including women in the uh, Korea are important, um, and then the possibilities of including women in more formally in ministry, uh, particularly ordained ministry as deacons, which uh, which I think they really they really better do. I think I think the Holy Father understands that he has a deep problem with women uh, around the world, and uh, uh, fewer and fewer are hanging on hanging on by their fingernails uh, polished or not and and I think that they uh, uh, the, the, what, what I have often said is that it's not just the women who are leaving um, they are not dragging their husbands to church they're not writing checks and they're not bringing their children up we, we've lost at least two or three generations at this point in the United States um, of uh, formerly Catholic women, Catholic school educated, high school and college, who are now in their 60s and 70s and 80s, whose children, grandchildren, and now great grandchildren um, are not being educated either at home or in school um, uh, to Catholicism. Uh, and, and that is, is uh, reverberating in the seminaries uh, I met four young men just the other day who were in a propedeutic year in a particular seminary. And the rector said, well, they really don't know anything about the Catholic intellectual tradition. So we're <laughs> trying, uh, trying to help them out. Well, it's not their fault because, yeah, yeah. you know, Catholic schools are, are, are fewer, and fewer and far between. And um, there's, uh, uh, there is, uh, it's a whole other topic, uh, uh, there is a change in the way Catholic uh, theology is being taught in even in Catholic schools. So, so that's what the book is. And it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's being used in schools. It's, it's not a bad read because it explains what synodality is yeah. and explains the, but uh, uh, you know, uh, it's going into another printing. Uh, it's being updated because uh, Benedict the Sixteenth has died, <laughs> you know. So there's a few little changes of uh, move a, move a question mark here or there. But um, but it's a bit as I said, and there will be a um, very soon a teacher's guide or a study guide up for Great. the book. So uh, and I think it's a pretty book, but you need to remember there's a word cloud on it here. So there's a lot of talking. 
going on and uh, we we uh, we need to have some act you know the, the point of us of uh, discernment is see judge act we've been seeing and we may be judging but i think it's a time for action well i just want to thank you for joining us it was a lovely conversation lively <laughs> as usual uh, and edgy too that you can always expect that um yes, well. when you're talking to to phyllis sagano um thank you very much for um for watching and and or listening if you're listening on the podcast and uh goodbye and god bless thank you so much